Well, the government has announced it hopes all primary age pupils in England can go back to school for a month before the summer break and is again advising that vulnerable children and those of essential workers should return now. The goal is for children to restart in nursery, reception, year one, year six on June the 1st, depending on the risk level of coronavirus. There's no return plan for England's secondary school children before the summer break. But teachers are being asked to allow for face-to-face -face time before then with those pupils who are facing key exams next year. Now, in Scotland and Wales, there is no change, no planned return dates, with Scotland's First Minister saying that the beginning of next month would be too soon for primary school classes to start there. And in Northern Ireland, the Education Minister has said it will be September when pupils are likely to begin returning to school. The teaching unions have expressed serious concerns about the government's plans to restart primary education in England. Our education correspondent, Elaine Dunkley, has been getting the reaction of parents and teachers in Cheshire. Even with just a few children, it's difficult. Soon pupils at Hartford Manor Primary will have to learn a new skill, how to keep their distance. Classes will reopen to all children in reception, year one and year six. How on earth do we get 30 children in a classroom and uh, make them socially distance? You can't do it. I'd like to see the children wearing facial coverings because if they then cough, it won't go onto the desk they're working at or onto the surface. I'd like to see teachers wearing it um, where possible. Miss Fitz is going to clean the table. Schools have remained open for children of key workers and those deemed as vulnerable. So why are certain age groups being prioritised to return first? For nurseries, reception and year one, it's a critical time in early years development. For those in year six, it's about preparing them for secondary school. But parents here are worried about safety. A lot of parents are scared that um, bringing the children back, it's going to increase the spread. One of our concerns, keeping the girls in school, was that we would potentially, from the hospital, acquire COVID, bring it back, pass it on unknown to our children, then bring it in and spread it further out in the community. I don't know how you, how you can open the schools and you can't guarantee people's safety. It's it's unfair. <laughs> My daughters are coping fine at home, um, they, they're quite happy and bubbly at home, but they're really desperate to come back to school and see the friends. That's the, a big part for, for them to come back and see the friends and play with the friends, and I don't see how that's going to be possible, because um, you can't enforce social distancing very well with children, I wouldn't have thought. Schools are keen ending the coronavirus lockdown. Reopening them is as much about the economy as it is about education. In order for the country to go back to work, children need to go back to school. It's now been eight weeks. Uh, my husband and I both run small businesses, so trying to keep both those businesses viable and have both the children at home and try and do some homeschooling has created like, a really high pressure environment. <laughs> Hello, Halloween! The government says it wants to get pupils back to school as soon as it's safe to do so, with smaller classes and hygiene a high priority. Drop-off and pick-up times will be staggered and outside spaces will be used to the full. More reassurances for parents and teachers. But will it give them enough confidence for children to return to classrooms? Elaine Dunkley, BBC News, Cheshire. As I mentioned earlier, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, ministers are insisting that the stay-home advice is saving lives and they've clearly distanced themselves, therefore, from the approach being taken by Boris Johnson in England. The differences have prompted many questions. What would the guidance mean, for example, for someone who lived in Wales but worked in England, or for someone who lived in England but wanted to visit Wales? Our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith, has been looking at the options. The Prime Minister has given us his roadmap. But are the borders clearly marked? For the people of Chepstow, it should be straightforward. They live in Wales under Welsh lockdown laws. The message here remains stay at home. But what about the 100,000 Welsh workers like Steve, whose jobs are in England? What if he gets called into a meeting? The clarity's just not there. I'm, you know, I believe that I'm right, that, you know, that, that the Welsh rules apply to me and that, that I must stay at home. But, uh, you know, am I right? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. In normal times, the border between England and Wales is crossed more than two and a half million times a week. It's not just people going to work, it's travelling to their nearest supermarket or visiting their GP. 
inevitably having different lockdown laws either side of the divide is now causing confusion. Driving to exercise isn't allowed in Wales. Only essential journeys are permitted. Anything else breaks the law. For Helena and her mum, there are more questions than answers today. They live on the English side of the divide, but Helena studies in Wales. Are we allowed to come and pick stuff up? Are we allowed to come over just the little bridge and come for a walk? Um, I've got to get my uni stuff um, from Cardiff. Um, is that essential? Am I allowed to go and get that? Peter has a different dilemma. His estate agency straddles both sides of the border. Today has brought a flurry of calls, but they're having to tell people not to drive into Wales. We just don't really know what to do. We're taking inquiries, but I'm saying to clients, look, I really know as much as you do. We're trying to, obviously, interpret what both the Welsh Government and the English Government are saying, and it's all a bit confusing, not only to us, but to the general public. The virus, of course, doesn't recognise borders, and this pandemic is now really testing how well the UK's nations can stick together. Howell Griffith, BBC News, Chepstow. Let's continue on this theme and talk to our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, who's in Glasgow. Um, and just a reminder for viewers, Sarah, that the First Minister there today was reminding people of Scotland of their obligations and the differences between Scotland and England. Yes, she gave a special broadcast on the television earlier this evening because Nicola Sturgeon's principal concern is to make sure that people in Scotland understand that the easing of the restrictions the Prime Minister has been discussing do not apply to people here in Scotland or in Wales or Northern Ireland. And there is increasing frustration in the Scottish Government that when the Prime Minister talks about the changes he's making, he doesn't make it explicitly clear that he means it's for England only. But of course, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland all have the legal right and responsibility to make their own lockdown rules. And here in Scotland, the message has not changed. It remains stay at home. Nobody's being encouraged to go to work or to uh, uh, spend more time outdoors. You can go outdoors for exercise more than once, but not to the same extent that uh, people are being allowed to in England. The rules really have hardly changed here at all. So there's obvious concern about mixed messaging, that people will be confused about which rules they ought to adhere to. And when Nicola Sturgeon explains why she isn't prepared to ease the lockdown further here, and she says that she daren't risk acting rashly or prematurely because lives are at risk, you can hear in that the unspoken criticism of Boris Johnson's decision. Now, she, of course, says that he has a perfect right to make the rules for England, but that he has to make it clear it is England that he's talking about, not the whole of the United Kingdom. Sarah, once again, many thanks. Sarah Smith, our Scotland editor.